Good evening. Welcome to New Earth Restoration Online Sukkot Service Day One. Hope you've had a set apart, a Kadosh day today. Hope that you've been able to fulfill the requirements of the Torah and been glad in it. I need to ask a question or two. Um, Brother Greg, are you scheduled to speak tonight or am I? I think I am, but I'm not sure. I thought it was you, brother. I okay. thought, uh, yes. I am prepared. So that means you'll have to stay an extra hour or so. All right. All right. I know you like that. Yes, that song that I played is called Essene Dream. And the whole idea of the song, I was writing the song about when I was 84. How I feel sitting out in the backyard for a, a, a Sukkot just by myself. All your friends are dead. You're sitting out there and all of a sudden they start coming to you in the spirit. And the next thing you know, by the end, you find yourself going off in a spaceship with a UFO. And then you get those kind of creepy noise and everything. Well, it was just a whim. I thought I'd play it today. I didn't think it would be received by anybody. It sounds a little creepy. Anyway, I'm glad to be here. I hope you are too. And we're going to have a real blessed night with the liturgy tonight. It's another new liturgy. And I believe that Marcel is going to leave tonight. I've got the Hebrew, you guys. We've got the bold man, that is Paul, and John is there for the uh, for the scripture readings. One's from Zechariah 4, and I think the other is Leviticus 23, so you might want to put that up on your screen too and get ready if you want to read tonight, John. Special guest tonight, we've got Joshua here who was, is part of my old Essene dreams. We've had some camping time together, and Joshua is the one who can go out into the woods with his daughter, I hope this is still true, and take nothing with him. He can eat right off the floor. He can eat what the raccoons eat. He can make a healthy day camp of it. Remember those raccoons, Joshua? I thought so. So um, let's get started. Yeah, yeah, those are the jokes. Yet there are some things tonight that we just simply can't joke about. And since I'm going to speak, I have that for you. Um, very serious situation. We want to keep it update. We want to keep it a little bit fun. What was the scripture? Well, I think it's Zechariah, something in Zechariah 14. And I think the other one's part of Leviticus 23. But it'll be coming up on the screen. Not the scripture itself. I didn't have room enough. But uh, the passages will come up. Okay, thank you, John. So again, let's get started. And thank you all who are helping me tonight. Participants can now see your application. This service is put together that it can be used every night of Sukkot. You know, Tabernacles is seven nights. And then the eighth night, you've got a feast unto itself called the Great Day. And we'll be back here on the great day, which is exactly seven days from tonight. That would be the ninth. And in the Shabbat in between, uh, the feast Shabbat. This is a feast of four species, which we don't have because we're at home and we're not out someplace. And we don't have a Sukkot, most of us. I mean, we don't have a little hut or a tent out with the rest of the Essenes, with the rest of the Nazarenes at this time. So it, I call this a memorial or teaching service. We do these things that we're directed to do in the spirit as though we were out there. 
just as a teaching and a memorialization to what we we're supposed to do this day and what we hope we can do next year. I really, really miss it. It was what I look forward to all year. And then when I got there for a week, I just griped all I could do. The readers, the unbold is read by the leader. Thank you, Marcel. The bold is read by the people, plus the leader of the people, Paul. The Kadesh and translated Hebrew is read by the Hebraicist, that's me tonight. And John, here are the scriptures. Leviticus 23, 33 through 44. Zechariah 14, 6 through 11, and 16 through 21, or you can read right through whatever you want to do, make it easier. Got a great voice. When we talk about the four species on uh, Sukkot, we're talking about the Etrog, often, uh, often pronounced Etrog, especially out here in the South which is also called the beautiful fruit. It's citrus, and it's hard to get an etrog. There's only one place that I know of in the United States that actually grows them. That's in New York. Can you believe that? But uh, you can buy one if you want to. Last time you could buy a lulab and an etrog for about $75 to $100. That is a racket. Yes, you can grow your own. You have to wait 10 years for that tree to give out its fruit. And I have never eaten one, but I understand that they're pretty good, though they're a little bit sour. In the past, I've used a Riker's lime, which you can find at the local grocery. Then we have some greenery here, three different types, part of the species. Myrtle. Not my great aunt. It's a plant with three leaves coming out of the same place on the stem. You'll need three myrtle branches. Willow, everyone knows what that looks like. Common tree. We need two willow branches. Then the lulav is a type of palm frond. Only one frond is needed. These are rather hard to get in your native habitation. So oftentimes um, I use, uh, let me see, what's the name of that? Hi, George. I use saw palmetto leaves. You know, the ones that down in the South here and mainline churches during Esther, Estra, they pull these up and they make crosses out of them. That is a saw palmetto, easy to identify. You can go pick those up even pretty far north. Then the myrtle, willow, and lulav are joined together. Generally, the lulav is in the middle. After being bound with a light string, these three species are collectively called the lulav. What is that for? Why do we wave it? Good question. I have to look it up every year because it just doesn't seem like it does anything, but we're commanded to do it. So look, we do it. And I've got a meditation already to start you with, and then we'll go to the liturgy. In the beginning was the Devar. The Devar was with the Elohim, and Eloas was the Devar. Literal word order. The Devar came to be Basar, which is flesh, and Tabernacles, Eskenosen. Very interesting word, because the word is aorist or past tense, but inside of this word is the word skeno, which means skin. Often it's referring to a tent made out of skin. 
The devar came to be basar and tablet, uh, flesh and blood, and tabernacled among us. This gives us one of John's regular clues as to when Christmas is. I shouldn't say that. When the birth of the Messiah into this world actually was during the first day of tabernacle. It says so right there. He came in flesh and blood among us and skinned among us. And we looked on his shining, the kavod of the only born of the father, monogenus. Genus is born. Mono is one or only. Monogenus the only born of the Father, full of favor and truth. Now, there is a literal translation for you from both. This is from both Greek and Hebrew. They really, uh, they really identify together for this very difficult passage. And it's a, a fearful thing that so many in our religious institutions read this off, and get the completely wrong interpretation. And you know, that kind of thing really sets me off. All right, I'm going to get that shofar ready. Okay, reader, go. Shofar, now let us come together to worship at the blast of the shofar. Opening prayer. Let us pray. May it be your will, O Yahweh Elohim of our fathers to cause your divine devar lagas to dwell in our midst. Spread your shelter of shalom over us and encircle us with Messiah's majestic radiance. We thank you for your presence, O Yahuwah, as it is written in your devar, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, you are present in our midst. Keep us mindful and watching for the hour of your return. When will we tabernacle with you forever in the Kodesh city, the new Jerusalem, waving the four spices? Hold the etrog in the left hand and the lulav in the right hand. Shake them up in each direction, as the Hebraicist says. You've got your stuff here. You've got your lulav, you've got your fruit. Okay, we're, we're pretending. Baruch atah Yahweh elchenu melech haolam asher kedshanu bemitzvotav uvdam Yeshua hamashiach vitzivanu el nitilat lulav. Blessed are you, you are our Elohim, King of the Universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments, and in the blood of Yahushua, Messiah, and commanded us to raise up the lulav. Leader. Face east. Exactly. Can you face east? If you can, please do. Great and mighty is Yahuwah Elohim of hosts. He alone is king over all the earth. Face north. He is my victory and my shield. In him I will have no fear. His radiance and his power surround me and preserve me. Face west. Behold, you, uh, Elohim, has become my salvation. His grace extended to we who believe and call upon his name. Face south. Israel is chosen of Yahuwah. In him we will trust. In him we will be justified. In him we've become more than conquerors. Face east again. 
Surely I will dwell in the house of Yahuwah forever. His goodness and his mercy will preserve me all the days of my life. Baruch Yahweh HaOlam, B'Shem Yahshua HaMashiach, Amen V'Amen. Blessed be Yahuwah forever in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen and Amen. You got your talit? Blessing, put on, putting on a talit. Baruch Ata Yahweh Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu Bevitzvatov Uvdam Yashua HaMashiach, Vitzvanu Lechita Tayef Betalit. Blessed are you, you are Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments, and in the blood of Yehushua, the Messiah, and commanded us to enwrap ourselves with the talit. And of Blessing course, for the... The talit is the prayer shawl. I'm sorry. Blessing for putting on the zitzi. Baruch ata Yahweh Elokeinu melech ha'olam. Asher Kidshanu Bamitzbatav Ubdam Yashua Hamashiach Vitsivanu Al Mitzvah Vitsitsit. Blessed are you, Yahuwah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and in the blood of Yahushua, the Messiah, commanded us to wear Zitsis. Tassels. Blessings for the putting the Telephim on our arms. Baruch Atai Yahweh Elokein Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotov Uvdam Yashua HaMashiach Vitsivanu L'Hanayach To Tefillin Blessed are you, Yahuwah Al Elohim, King of the Universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and in the blood of Yahushua, the Messiah, and commanded us to put on the telephine. Blessing for putting on the mitzvah. We mentioned that tefillin is what they call a phylactery in the Bible, but I noticed that there's a kind of a fashion among people that are keeping Torah of using bracelets with a sacred name on them instead and putting them all around their uh, arms. Th that would be a type of tefillin. Uh, let's see. Some people still putting them on their heads. Now, that is not a rabbinical uh, custom. That is something we can see in the scripture. And in fact, there is a command to do that, except it's well out of style today. I was thinking perhaps next year, when we meet in the new Yerushalayim, we'll have all these things together and we'll be able to see each other. As for the mezuzah, that is the thing with a little bit of Torah inside of it that you see on the doorposts of houses. They put it out there and it's got, uh, see, I want to say Sigma, um, What, what's the Hebrew letter S? Why can't I remember this? Sheen. What is it? Sheen. Sheen. Okay. That's what they have on that mezuzah. And inside there, there's a little handwritten piece of parchment or paper that you have written the parts of the Shema in there or whatever you think is appropriate. And then put it outside your door on the door post, you know, on the, um, the stuff that's around the door. And not only is that supposed to be for a blessing, but it's also, if you go into the spirituality of the mezuzah, it is to keep the devil out of there. And that's why a lot of people in the movement today, they'll put a mezuzah at every door, and especially around the bathroom door. So Baruch Ata Yahweh Elokeinu Melech Olam Asher Kedshanu B'Mitzvotav 
ובדם יהושע, יהושע מושיעת וציוונו לכבואה מזוזה. Blessed are you, Yehua, our Elohim, King of the Universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and in the blood of Yehushua, the Messiah, and commanded us to put on the mezuzah. Good. On viewing the marvels of creation. Baruch ata Yahweh Elokeinu melech haolam asher ma'asa berishit. Blessed are you, Yehua, our Elohim, King of the Universe, who has fashioned the works of creation. Shofar. Here we go. The Tekia Hagadol, I'm looking for it. One very long tukia. Congregational prayers. Baruch et Yahweh Hamavorach. Praise Yahuwah, to whom all praise is due. Baruch et Yahweh Hamavorach, Leolam Vaid. Blessed be Yahuwah, to whom all praise is due forever and ever. Baruch ata Yahweh Elokeinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Bidvaro Ma'ariev Araviem. Blessed are you, O Yahweh Elohim, King of the Universe. You who brings on the evenings at your word. With wisdom you open the gates of the sky, and with understanding you change the times and cause the seasons to alternate. You arranged the stars in their courses in the sky according to your will. You created day and night. You roll away light before darkness and darkness before light. You cause the day to pass and the night to come and make distinction between day and night. Yahweh Savayot is your name, commander of armies. Baruch Atah Yahweh Hamavorach Aravi M. Blessed art you, O Yehua, who brings on the evenings readings. John, do you have them? Levit yes. Good. I was a little slow on the mute button. Leviticus 23, 33 to 44. Again, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the 15th of this seventh month is the Feast of Booze for seven days to Yahshua. On the first day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work of any kind. For seven days you shall present an offering by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to Yahweh. It is an assembly. You shall do no laborious work. There are the appointed times of Yahshua which you shall proclaim as holy convocation to present offerings by fire to Yahweh, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each day's matter on its own day, besides those of the Sabbaths of Yah, and besides your gifts and besides all your votive and free will offerings, which you give to Yahweh. On exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the Feast of Yahweh for seven days with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now on the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim for seven days. You shall thus celebrate it as a Feast of Yahweh for seven days in the year, it shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booze for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booze, so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booze 
when I had brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your Elohim. So Moses declared to the sons of Israel the appointed times of Yahweh. Second scripture, Zechariah 14, 6 through 11. In that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day, which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that in that, that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth in that day. Yahweh will be the only one and his name the only one. All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. People will live in it, and there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Now verse 16 through 21. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Yahweh of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the family of, the, of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which Yahweh smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booze. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booze. In that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to Yahweh, and the cooking pots in Yahweh's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to Yahweh of hosts. All who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them. And there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of Yahweh of hosts in that day. Response. Amin, amin. Let the prophets prophesy. I think we determined that I'll be doing that tonight. It's my privilege to do that, and especially for you. Weren't those scripture passages appropriate for today? As people talk about flat earth all the time. You might believe in flat earth. You might not. But one thing is for sure, if that prophetic passage comes true, or is true, it says there that it will be laid out like a plane. That's, that's flat. And look, there's this punishment to Egypt and to all the ethnoi, the nations, that will not come forward to keep this feast of Sukkot in its time, and uh, this is going to hit certain nations in this world pretty hard, including ours. Because understand that going up to Jerusalem is not going up to Mount Zion. It's going up into the sky. If you believe that Revelation is for the future or for our time, then your Jerusalem is going to be up there, and it's going to be huge, and there's going to be light coming from it because the king will be there, and the people will still be on the earth, although 
who they're speaking of here is you. You'll come up to Jerusalem. The rest will be left behind, but they'll know what's going on. And if you're uh, rambunctious about it, then what could be a better punishment to get you to start considering that while you're doing tabernacles in the sky, they be doing ta tabernacles on the earth. And uh, if Iran sends missiles to Israel or any place else, well, we're just going to shut the water off. We're just going to shut your water off. Wouldn't it be something if Israel shut their water off? The unfortunate thing about it is I don't think all those people go for it. It's their wicked, satanic leaders that are leading them into this. Just like we have religious leaders here too, leading us back into paganism as is our government leaders. Now, you're not supposed to talk about politics, but I'm just mentioning a fact. And I want to go over to a passage. You know, I've been working with Revelation, well, really, since about 1988. Um, I'm always in it. I've always been in it, uh, especially the last several months. I began, again, to translate that book and translate it correctly because now getting into the languages, and I was I was taught how to translate in the university. And um, I have done it and used it ever since then. It's in the 90s. And so I have gotten a little rusty lately, and I thought I better get back into this before if you don't do something, you lose something. You know that. So I've been retranslating Revelation without all that um, is Elizabethan English and all those translations that might have been valid in the 15th, 16th century, but are, simply aren't valid anymore. Uh, and a, a number of words are like flashpoints in Revelation that if you're using those old translations, then you, you don't know when it's happening or where it's happening, really. But if you put correct translations for today into those words as though it were written for people today to read it and see what is going on there, then everything changes. Right, Paul? Everything changes. When you find out that it's not talking about the world, the earth, you find out it's talking about the land, Eretz Israel the land. It's talking about that land. In fact, the whole Bible is about the land of Israel, which extends from the Nile River to the Euphrates River, the good crossing river, and up about just as far north and south. That's Eretz Israel. Well, I know it's captive now, but the time will come when we're going to have a new ruler. And what I believe, I believe the revelation is already fulfilled. You know that. Being fulfilled in the first century, uh, 66 AD to 73, those seven years. But, as people say, what happens next? I think we can hold on to at least some of it to see it happening in the future. No, I'm not going to talk about the rapture right now and get everybody all stirred up. But um, look at it. If you look, want to look at it from a future perspective, we know, at least in this dimension, that the New Jerusalem is not seen up in the sky. And we are not yet able to go up there until we get our new spiritual bodies. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure it will appear, and it will appear at least to the believers. And as I mentioned before, it says that the, the people will get their light from no longer the sun, but from Elohim in the city. 
and they'll be able to get close to the light, some of them, those who have done good in this life, but they won't be able to get up there unless they're specially invited, as John the Revelator was invited to come up there. He says, all of a sudden, I was in the spirit or wind. I was in the wind that carried me up to this place. He couldn't describe it anymore, though what he saw in that place, his brain translated it into things that he might be able to understand and write down. Now, when we come to be fully in the spirit, we will no longer have to wonder what this these prophecies say. We'll be able to see it clearly as it is, and we'll say to ourselves, why couldn't I see that before? Why couldn't I? Well, you know, we have five senses. Some people have six. And those senses are attuned to certain types of stimulus. And that's all. We can't see ultraviolet. We can't say, see infrared. We can't see radio waves. But that spectrum of waves is infinitely long, and just a little, little fraction of it can we perceive. The rest of it we can't. Those things belong to Elohim, who is not a man. He's really not that man sitting on a throne up in the sky someplace with a long beard. He is spirit. I know that's shocking. I know it's shocking that he's not up there sitting on a throne. This is in um, this is in language that we're not supposed to get completely. It's like when they ask Yahshua, why do you speak in parables with these stories? And both in Matthew and Mark, he's recorded as saying that he does so so people can't understand him. But some people can those who are enlightened, those who live in the world of good spirits, those who have been changed already. How do you know you've been? Because of your zeal. You can't stop loving Elohim and doing as he says. All right, I get to this passage because I want to reveal something to you that I that I found. Let's see, okay. I've got three passages here. And I want to let you see them as well. <clears throat> When I was writing my first book on the interpretation of Revelation, it was called Revelation Uncloaked. And that was about 89 and 90 when I was doing that. Completed it and changed my understanding on it from futurist perspective to a preterist or a, uh, a present, actually past perspective. And as I mentioned, I've done now 15 sessions of why I believe that it is in the past, as well as the whole scholarly community also knows that it follows exactly with Josephus' version of the Jewish war of 66 to 73. Now, we, we don't make a distinction here of whether you believe it's future or past. That really doesn't make any difference when it comes to our fellowship, unless it is a matter of one side not being able to stand the other side or forbidding the other side to speaking about it. And that's why we had a little split last month. That's why we had a little split, because somebody decided that they would not allow anyone in our yihad to speak about this anymore. Uh, that was very unfortunate, and I, I feel a great loss. 
but on a, when I was working on this in 90, I think I made a discovery which has a lot to do with what's happened just the last few days. And I want to look at Revelation 10, 1. This is my translation of this passage. It's a literal translation, and I kept in word order as it is in the original just as much as I possibly could. And I saw, says Yochanan, another powerful messenger coming down out of the sky, cloud-wrapped, with a rainbow over its head and its face as the sun, and its legs, feet, as the columns of fire and holding in its hands a small scroll that was opened. Remember, this was opened in chapter 5 when Yeshua was found to open this scroll, the scroll of life. And it put its right foot upon the sea and left foot upon the land also. Maybe you remember that there was a wonder of the ancient world called the Colossus of Rhodes, it's like, I think, 250 feet high. It was a copy of a man of war that had one foot on one piece of land, the other foot on another piece of land, and in between was a strait, a water strait. So that's the scroll we're talking about here. He was given this little scroll that Yochanan saw and Yeshua opened, and it put its right foot on the sea and its left foot upon the land also, and it cried out with a great voice, similar to a roaring lion. And when it cried out, the seven thunders themselves replied in their own voices. And when the seven thunders had spoken, I was about to write, till I heard a voice out of the sky saying, Seal up what's spoken by the seven thunders. Don't write them. And the messenger that I'd seen standing on the sea and on the land lifted its right hand into the sky and swore by the one living through the ages of the ages, time is over. So when I was studying this at that time, I was also reading other passages. That seems like that's all I did when I wasn't trying to find money or work someplace. Um, and I was reading through Job, and I hit 37, and I had in mind this passage about the thunders. Shut those thunders up. Don't tell what they are. And I found something here that I think answers the questions of what they were saying. Listen. Listen to the trembling of his voice and the sound that comes from his mouth. He lets it loose under all the skies and is lightning to the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roars. He thunders with the voice of his excellency, and he does not hold them back when his voice is heard. Ale thunders wondrously with his voice, doing great deed, which we do not understand, for he says to the snow, be on the earth. Also to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength, he seals up the hand of every person. What can we do about it? Nothing, still. For all men to know his work, we can't know. From the room of the south comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds of the earth. By the breath of ale, ice is given and the expanse of water becomes solid. He also loads the thick clouds with moisture. He scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, 
to do whatever he commands them on the face of the earthly world. He causes it to come. Stop there. What Elihu is talking about, and I think of Job's friends, Elihu is correct. He's the right one. The rest are, are pr pretty right, but there's always something wrong with their advice. Until we get to Elihu, which means he is my Elohim. And all this down here is concerning to weather, concerning to the weather. As I go through to this point, I thought thunders, thunders in here. What if it's the same thunder as in Revelation 10? So what I did was I got out the Hebrew this time, and you know, I... I can't do Hebrew a little bit, not much. I never was interested in learning Hebrew because I wanted to find out about Yahshua. I mean, during his lifespan, I want to know about the human being, Yahshua, and about his apostles. And that is what I've been doing, if I can say it, my whole career. And this is part of it, too, is discovering or trying to the primitive beliefs of Yahshua and his men and women and also their practices. And I have learned a lot. And that's a problem because uh, people, they, they are very untrusting of somebody else's research or experience because People who are very religious, they already know everything. They know everything. You know, they've been listening to Kenneth Copeland for 20, 30 years now. And, you know, he, he, he covered everything, right? And he's, you know, he's got the ear of the Lord. And education, especially in the Hebrew Roots movement, is frowned upon. Trust me, I know because... I've been frowned upon because of the interpretation of things, some things that I've had. But I've always tried to look at this scripture, not only the original language, as far as we know what it is, but also outside the church box. It was hard to get out of it because of my long standing time in the church. 25 years as a church pastor and sacred musician, and then probably another 25 years as a, a lay person, a lay minister in the church. It was hard to get out of that way of thinking. And still, sometimes, if I make a discovery or find something that is not Orthodox Christian, like the Trinity, Orthodox Christian, but absolutely not scriptural, just the opposite, things like that, I feel guilty. I feel guilty. And I think, is God going to send me to hell for this? And then I get assurance. No, because you have been ordained to do this. This is your job. You want to do this, that, or the other thing in the evangelical movement. You had these things planned, but this isn't your calling. My friend, take a lesson from that. You might be trying to work in what's not your calling. If you do that, you'll be mediocre. You'll get some things done, but you will never get to the epitome, or the, I should say, the uh, the summit of where you're supposed to be. And when that time comes that you are facing with the judge, he's going to say, you did a great job. But if you had done this, can you see it now? If you had done this, can you see it now? You would have been a lot more successful for the kingdom 
and for the movement on earth. So because of that, you're going to get to start working in the gifts that you have instead of the ones you don't have. And you're going to be happy about it because you're going to be doing what you love right there on that earth, still full of people lost as Hogan's goat. Now, that's your millennium. He causes it to come whether a rod, as a rod, as punishment, or for his land, or for kindness. Now, of course, this is going to be interpreted in light of this horrendous hurricane. One of our people usually is in the service. I don't know if she is here tonight, but she lives just about an hour north of Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, I sent her a note to see if she was all right. And she wrote back what was going on up there. And even today, I watched a little of the news when I was eating my breakfast. And wow, wow. You know, I've been through six hurricanes myself with a lot of damage, but nothing like that. Uh, maybe one of them. It was on the Feast of Trumpets in 2004. It was Hurricane Ivan. That was horrible, but not quite as bad as this. That tore down the whole uh, city of Pensacola. I mean, destroyed it in Pensacola Beach. It took years to build that back up. But this thing goes clear up to North Carolina and it's still going up. And everybody, it seems like in the eastern half of the United States has felt some of this. And I was so happy to find that she was okay. Her house held up, just being that short of a way from the center of that hurricane. <laughs> a real good example of how Elohim helps protect his children. And even if he doesn't, look, he causes it to come, whether a rod or for his land or for kindness. Well, this is about weather again. Now, a rod, I didn't want to talk about punishment because that happens sometime. He'll send it as a punishment someplace. It's untimely. You know, look at that Katrina hurricane. Um, New Orleans, that coast is Gambler's Coast. Gamblers. You, you go to one of those casinos and what you see during the day is scads of poor people in there. You know they're poor. People with crutches. People that are wearing rags. Gambling away quarter by quarter their welfare check. And they're hooked. They cannot stand to be at home. They have to go daily to that gambling casino where they are let in on those machines and allowed to come in. And then they, they have to pay a little to get in there. And then they get to eat anything they want all the time. They want to stay there. And the food's good. Well, they get some food, yes, but maybe they just don't have to use their money for that anymore if they go to the casino every day. I'm not talking about that punishment. But I would say if anything we've seen as punishment, it would have to be Katrina. Nothing they could do about it. The last one here is or for kindness. Some Bibles have compassion in there. I think the word that's in there, if I recall, is raham, which means mercy. He's doing something good. Well, now, maybe that has to do with the one earlier, for his land. These lands are part of Yahweh's creation. They're created good. But anything that you hold valuable, you need to take care of. 
Look at that car of yours. You ought to see mine. Yes, I'm driving a beater, and I'll drive that beater until it falls apart. It's almost falling apart. Why? Because I've got other ideas for the little bit of money I have. And I want to thank some of you. You helped me, which is wonderful. I used to not be able to take a gift. But I learned that those that give gifts, those that support their tithes to the minister, they get blessed. Even if they don't get tenfold back, they're blessed. They feel good to have, having done that. And Elohim bless you. Bless you. Those caring for Haiti today, out of this group, I cried out with my voice last month because our money was so low and there were so many needs there and so much needed here that month and nothing hardly came in. But then one day, go to the mail, wow. And the next day and the third day and today, what I call a big donation comes in from somebody I never even heard of in the middle of New York City. Nobody here. I can't find this guy. I want to get in touch with him and thank him. So um, I have a little bit of abundance once for kindness. The land needs that kind of succor. Take, for instance, that Gulf of Mexico there where New Orleans is. Those kind of places need to be flushed out once every 10 or 15 years, or they will not only deteriorate, that is physically, but they deteriorate on account of the hands of humankind in there with their trash and with their tin cans and their stuff that doesn't belong in those places. And if he values a place like the beaches, Pensacola Beach, Tampa Beach, even in California, some of those beaches, I don't know who would ever want to bless that place. But he's got to do something. It just gets to the point where something has to be done. And he loves the land. For him... This land is alive. Haven't you read Romans chapter 8, how creation with longing cries out, groans for the revelation of the children of Elohim? These people fouling these places up with their junk, with their pets, with their bulldozers. Those aren't the Yeladim Le Elohim. They're not of Elohim. They're of the first creation. I truly believe spiritless humans, when they can do that and care nothing, for the land, just use it up. They're not born again, they're spiritless. You get your spirit when you're born again. He's got to do something, if I can call him a he. And sometimes the land takes precedence over the people, or should I say vermin that's on it. Sometimes he sees the groaning of creation and he is having to do something about it. Uh, the day is coming. We call this new earth restoration. We're talking about the restoration of all creation. Now, the woke people are talking about equity, which is a, it's a fake word for, well, racism. We'll put it that way. Equity is racism. But we talk about judicial not equity oh somebody tell me I'm getting older some of these words get out of my mind uh, justice 
justice for all, justice for creation, justice for a creation that's been condemned to hold humans that are not of Elohim and put up with whatever they decide to give it. So equitable justice, that's not equity. Equitable justice, all humans' creations, rocks and stones, trees, lands, people in the past, people in the future, people now. We're promised in this covenant in the book of Enoch and in the book of Romans and all over the place that nobody has discovered, I guess, but me. It's a covenant. Maybe the first covenant. And that is that Yahweh is going to bring equitable justice to all creation. Uh, yeah, you're going to get payback. Yes, this is what uh, Yahweh says when he says, vengeance is mine, I'll repay. Just don't worry about it. Somebody does you wrong, don't worry about it. Just get over it. Because the day will come when, whether you like it or not, creation is going to be dealt out with equitable justice. And that person, that godless person that is bothering you or persecuting you, they're going to get theirs. That's all there is to it. Now, see, did I tell you that in this, in the original language, there are seven thunders? You can't see it in English. You have to go to the Hebrew or the Greek, either one. Because there's a couple of times when the translator translates thunder as lightning. Seven thunders here. Now, the message is in a parable. It's not exactly clear unless you take a macro view and you can see this is about weather cleaning up the earth. And as I said, sometimes the earth has precedence over humankind. I'll leave it at that and go on as for the seven thunders. Oh, here's Dave Wagner, a new uh, person that I have just met. Well, we're still going. Let's see here. When did we start? Seven. Oh, we've been going a while, haven't we? Have I been going an hour? I have. hope not, because I've got about 10 minutes more. Verse 14. Listen to this. Oh, Yov. Yov. Stand still and consider the wonders of hell. Do you know when Eloah placed them and caused the lightning of his cloud to shine? That might be one of those thunders right there. Do you know the balancing of the clouds, the wonders of the one perfect in knowledge? Why are your garments hot when the earth is stilled from the south? Did you, with him, spread out the clouds strong as a hard mirror? Well, we would think so by the smart retorts of some religious folk. Teach us what we should say to him, Elohim. We do not set in order because of darkness. This is couched in language that's difficult to understand. Would any man ask to be swallowed up? So men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise of heart. Now, this is saying that who think they're wise of heart, because alongside Elohim, you don't know anything. Ah, swallowed up. Here's something I heard on that weather news today. This is number two. The earth swallowed up a guy in Asheville during that hurricane in, uh, is that Hurricane Helena or Helene? That was uh, yesterday, October 1st. He was swallowed up to his chest in muck with stuff on top of him. 
And there he was stuck. He was stuck there a long time. They couldn't get rescue workers in there. The neighbors kind of cleared things out in the rain and in the, the wind, trying to get an open place where rescue workers could get in. And finally, they got there and they weren't able to do anything about him until nine o'clock at night. So he was in there uh, probably since the night before. And he went down in that muck, but the rescue workers were actually able to finally get him out. But what I heard said concerning him, when the rescue workers got him out and took him to the hospital, he died about four in the morning. He died of the harm that the rescue workers had done trying to get him out. He died. I felt so sad about that. Well, that neighbor of his was talking about this to the news person, stuttering around, and so, so very, very, um, very concerned about what people would think of his talk. He did a good job, did a good job, and this is the story came out of it. Would any man ask to be swallowed up? So funny that uh, reading this and then this thing would come up the very same day. He was swallowed up and rescued, but he still died unless he was a believer, born again, born of spirit, not spiritually dead anymore. He never would die. He wouldn't even know it. And as they say, to as an excuse, he's in a better place now. Well, really, is that not true? Is that not true? I like funerals that are happy events. That's why I don't go to them anymore. Because they don't celebrate what should be celebrated. They're not about the person that died. They're about the people in the pew. Oh, I'm getting way off here. That's when I don't use a script. This was happening to me. On the other hand, we have... The thunders, I guess you already read this, harmful and unmentionable things coming down from the sky like thunder, yet they're not mentioned here except weather things. Now, the revelator can only speak of thunder because what's coming down in our day hadn't been invented or even conceived in that day. And of course, I'm talking about these guided missiles coming down on Israel. You know, Trelly lived there for five years in Tel Aviv. They're coming down in Joppa and Tel Aviv. Nobody's been hurt. 200 missiles came down. Nobody's been hurt. The one soldier was killed in, I think, Lebanon. I have opinions on that just as you do. But it seems unbelievable to me that these weapons that the revelator knew nothing of, he talks about coming down from the earth, and the thunders, they can't talk about it. Elohim doesn't let them talk about it because these people who had to figure this prophecy out for their own day would not have even known what they were. And even the, the rocks that fall, it's the only way that Elohim can express this to Yochanan is that rocks are falling out of the sky or a mountain falls out of the sky. But look here, I wonder how many of those missiles that the Iron Dome got and how many Mikael, the archangel, got. How can 200 of those rockets not kill anybody? Wow, you know, that's divine in intervention, no matter what you think. Can't these idiots who are reporting to us in the media see that that is a miracle of Elohim and give him glory? Glory. Hmm, but... That's humankind that's sending these things down.
not Elohim, and we're getting used to it, but not as much as we would if it was coming down here. I think of Liss, Liss Goodwin. We've done several interviews with her. She is living in uh, Ukraine, in that ancient city down south, Odessa. See, I have to just think a while. Odessa. And she was able to get out of there and go to Romania. If you know her, what I'm talking about, she's a British girl looking for adventure. She's uh, well set for money, so she can come and go as she please. So she goes to Ukraine. And she is doing Hebrew roots there and getting visions and revelations of Yahweh. And she is learning. So Liz came back when all the coast was clear there in Odessa, came back to Odessa from Romania. And the bombs started falling. And as I looked at a picture of um, Joppa that the newsman had on there, a film of Joppa, and saw those things coming down out of the sky, all lit up, all over the place, lit up in that dark sky. It was nightmare. It was the thing that I've had nightmares about. What if it was coming down here? What would you think? Well, of course you'd take precautions, but you better be hidden under the feathers of the father's wing. <laughs> That's where you're going to find the best protection. It's a horrendous thing. Lights coming out of the sky that's going to certainly kill hundreds or thousands of people, and they don't kill anybody. Why aren't those guys in Joppa, praising Elohim constantly. And I think it was just a different time. Trelly was there living there for five, as I mentioned. That could have happened at that time. And she could have got killed with that. It would be horrible to even think about. All right. It's up to humankind to stop those as quickly as possible and as thoroughly as possible for the sake of humankind, we sometimes, if not always, have to solve our own problems. And the way this problem is being solved by the world is ridiculous. It is not even worthy of the intelligence of human beings. I'm talking about primarily the U.S. government. There's only one way that Yahweh says we're getting rid of this kind of stuff. And if you don't know what it is, that one way, go read Habakkuk, the prophet. It's only three chapters, originally just two. Go read that. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You'll see what Yah's way is. So uh, that is my message for tonight. And... I hope that there's something you can get out of that. I worked hard on that translation. And um, I'm just happy you're here. I'm happy that I have such a discerning people that will listen to me and consider it what I have to say. And listen, brother and sister, you got something to say? You can turn to me. I'll listen. I'll listen to you. Just call me or send me an email. It's best. I don't carry the phone with me. Or leave me a message. If you need to talk, yes, I went through training as a counselor. A lot of it. Marriage counselor, a mental illness counselor. I'll be glad to help you if you don't think I'm, I'm just too slap happy here. <laughs> I just like doing this. And I was happy because I didn't have to use tonight a manuscript I didn't have to read a manuscript so that was good and I, I thank you very much slap happy okay hi son
Wait a minute. Uh, my screen has stoved up. Here we go. We're right here. Asanat. Pretty good. Hoshana. La Ma'ank Elohenu Hoshana. La Ma'ank Vorenu Hoshana. La Ma'ank Goelenu Hoshana. La Ma'ank Dorsenu Hoshana. O oh, do send us your deliverance for your sake, O oh Elohim. Deliver us for your sake, O oh Creator. Deliver us for your sake, our Redeemer. Deliver us for your sake, our, our guide. Deliver us. Telehem. Yeah, I know it's late, my friends. Uh, is it? But we've got to do this for sure. This is important. Open up. Yeah, well, let's do the Tehillim first. Which means if you've got prayer or you got a praise report, yes, uh, we want to hear you. Or if you got something to say, that's fine. We just ask that you, because I took so much time, you just keep it a little short and try not to cry. Anybody? I just want to praise Yahweh for being here. Thank everyone for the service. Love y'all. Just just happy to be here. And I'll try not to cry this time, but but the end, I, I may. Shalom. That's our apostle, Gregory Holsapple. We love him. I don't know what I'd do without him right now. Anybody else? Do you want to pray? Can I find a prayer warrior tonight? I'll pray if you'd like. Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, Father, in, in the sky, we just praise and worship you. We thank you for sending Yahushua to us because he's our tent of protection. He's our tabernacle, and he watches over us, and we thank you for us to be able to gather tonight. And we thank you for working with such frail living beings that we were and now that we're spirit filled we thank you for working with us even though we're not perfect and we just thank you for your son's perfection so that we're able to walk in your ways as best we are able and we just praise and worship you and i pray a blessing on everyone that showed up tonight and even the ones who couldn't make it tonight that you would just have your walk minister to them and bring them the things that they need to have to keep moving forward in you. In Yahushua's name I pray. Amen. That was an excellent prayer. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay. We've got this Kaddish in Hebrew. I'm going to skip that tonight. <clears throat> I didn't mean to talk so long, but you guys know me. So let's start right here with the Kaddish in English. And Esteemed and sanctified be Elohim's great name throughout the world that he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and during your days and within the life of the entire house of Israel speedily and soon and say, Amen. Amen. May his great name be blessed forever to all eternity, blessed and praised, made radiant and exalted, extolled and honored, adored and lauded be the name of the Kadosh One. Blessed be he. Beyond all blessings and hymns, praises and consolations that are ever spoken in the world and say, Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us and for all Yisrael and say, Amen. 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 He who creates peace in his celestial heights, may he create peace for us, for all Israel and say, Amen. 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 Adan Olam. 
This is a special prayer. Is there, John, you want to lead this prayer if you're still there? You still John there? is no longer here. Okay. John is yeah. right here. He had to go. Sovereign of the world, King Supreme. Marcel? Before all creation came to be, when by his will all things were wrought, the name of our sovereign was first made known. And when this age shall cease to be, he still shall reign in majesty. He was, he is, and he will be all glorious eternally. Incomparable, Yahweh is one. No other can his nature share without beginning without end. Unto him, all strength and majesty. He is the living one who saves my rock when grief or sorrows fall, my banner and my refuge, my cup of life whenever I call. And in his hand I place my soul, both when I sleep and when I wake, and with my soul and body too. El is with me, there is no fear. Closing prayer. Prepare our hearts, O Yah, for our deliverance throughout the week until we find ourselves fully dressed for the wedding supper of the Lamb of Elohim. Amen. Amen. Va Amen. Service is finito. Again, so great to have you here. I would be remiss if I didn't give you a chance to help uh, support our mission program. And we got three of them now, Haiti, Kenya, and Uganda. That was the third one I couldn't think of the other day. But uh, we have the proprietors of those ministries who are hands-on coming on in the weeks to come through the uh, October and November. So we'll get some reports for them. And the in the chat, I'll put a link for you. It's like the, the preacher here locally says, I've been in this church for 17 years, and not one time have I ever preached for money. Well, that's too <laughs> bad. He should preach for money once in a while. And there it is. Very easy to remember. You can designate your funds out there to helpyahad.com. Whatever goes over our little bit of expenses each month, we do send down right straight down, mostly to Haiti, but also to those other ministries too. If you know of a good ministry that is worthy of being supported, you know, sometimes we have more money. Especially if you're involved in one, let us know, will you? Maybe we can help you out a little bit too. So, in the name of Yahshua, have shalom for the rest of the night and throughout the week of all. See ya, Shabbat.